everybody and welcome to another free training here in the Entrepreneur Hub. This week's training on a Freaky Friday is all about how to run a successful retreat. Now, having run over about 15 retreats here and overseas, I think I've got a fair bit of an idea of uh, how to do that successfully. We've had anywhere from, I have had personally anywhere from three people to 50 people on my retreats and uh, logistically not a lot changes but there's 10 tips that you can't do without if you want to actually fill the retreat like get people on board and make sure that you've got all of those places and spaces filled out and make sure that you haven't missed anything and and you get don't get to the middle of the retreat and go I wish I'd have thought of that thing or you get to the end of the retreat and you go oh I so could have done x y or z all right uh hey Chisa hey Mickey hey Moira hey Madeline hey anybody else who's joining us uh and some of you guys have actually been away with me on some of our retreats so I first started doing retreats uh, back as a naturopath who was burnt out. I was really, really tired of seeing one-on-one -on -one clients. I was seeing about 40 to 50 clients a week. And uh, that amount of consultations really takes it out of you, especially on my big days. I used to have um, really long Thursdays where I would see up to like 14 or 15 people in a day. And I was trying to figure out a way that I could do one to many that uh, didn't include a whole bunch of tech. And one of those was workshops and we used to fill out a workshop room, but that would, there wouldn't be enough space. And I have a lot to say about things. And so I was really keen to actually spread it out over a longer period. So I started with day retreats at our clinic. And then, so that was a whole day where we, um, you know, took some people and took them on a little journey from what they did know to what they didn't know got them experientially experiencing some really cool stuff, especially around stress relief and stress reduction. I brought in some other speakers, things like that for a day, like an urban retreat. Then that expanded out. I'm a bit of an all go, go all in type of person. So uh, that expanded out to our overseas retreats over in uh, different countries in Asia, where we were able to create an immersive experience and I went and checked out a couple of places, which is super cool when you're running uh, a business that you get to go and check out and, and do a reconnaissance mission on somewhere that you would like to run uh, an event. And so then when I did a, um, one of my first five day events overseas and it was amazing. It was a whole new level of understanding, a whole new level of being able to give and be of service uh, in a really deep way to the eight people who came to that. When I came back uh, to Australia, I thought, oh, so many people have messaged me and said that they, they didn't want to actually come overseas, so I'll run one here in Australia. And uh, I thought, okay, where's somewhere that inspires me? Because it was really easy for me to fill my overseas retreat because I was so inspired by it. I know some of you guys would freak out about it, but if you're also inspired by running something, uh, go with the thing that brings you the most joy and that you're most inspired by because you're going to be the most motivated to actually fill it and do the work to fill it, even if it feels icky or weird or different. Because my experience of going and running something that I wasn't quite as inspired by, uh, I ran a retreat here in uh, the Hawkesbury River. And uh, it was a beautiful, amazing, magical um, uh, building, like a, a lovely stays kind of accommodation. You can get them on Airbnb and things now. Uh, a beautiful accommodation. And I was expecting to get, you know, 10 people like I did for the overseas one. And I ended up getting three. I ran it anyway because, and I highly suggest you guys do, if you don't fill out your retreats and it's at a break even point, running a retreat for an, in an intimate group changes the dynamic and you can provide some really amazing kind of one-on-one -on -one time. You can really provide individualized attention. And that's in stark contrast to the 50 people I took to another overseas immersion. And the difference of the logistics of getting people in and out of minibuses, getting them to uh, the experiential experiences we had outside of the resort and things like that. So uh, it really changes. But if no matter how many people you get, 
they're humans that have put their hand up to spend time with you to take a deeper dive into usually their health and their well-being and their mindset around what they could change in their life to move them forward. So don't negate if you only get a few people on those first ones. Those few will turn into a few more, which will turn into a few more. And if this is your thing and if you realise through experiencing it this is your thing, then these top 10 tips will help you. All right. Hey, Rowena. Hey, Maria. Hey, anybody else who's joining us on the replay. All right. Let's start with the 10 top tips. Number one. Now, you'd think it was like, oh, maybe I should just plan what I'm going to do. What could I provide for these people? What gifts could I give them? No, it's pick a date. It's the most simplest of things, but often when I'm mentoring other practitioners in this, this is the thing that you guys ignore. <laughs> but it's the thing that's most important. You need to really seriously think about your ideal client, the person that you'd love to have on the retreat. Whether they're a mum, they might not want it in school holidays or they might want it in the school holidays because they've got backup to look after their kids. Whether they are a business person and end of financial year might not meet the criteria, they might need it at a different time of year. So you really have to pick a date. That's number one, because you actually can't get a decent quote from the places that you're running a retreat from or check on availability for the place that you'd like to run your immers immersive retreat on unless you have a date. So it's really, really important. The first thing before anything else, before that, you know, you've got that beautiful spark, holding that spark and picking a date. <laughs> it's the most important thing. So number one, pick a date. Number two is pick a venue. Obviously, if you're going to pick a date, you have to find out whether or not the place is available. And I've done this before where uh, I was running a workshop. I was like, yeah, I'm going to just run it there. This date will work for everybody. And then the place wasn't available. So I had to go out to all the people who ended up booking and I had to tell them it was going to be at a different, different venue. Otherwise, you, can't, you know, you're going to have to change the date. So it's really important to one, pick a date, two, pick a venue. And when you're picking a venue, definitely go for the one that will give you the vibe that you're looking for. The thing about an experiential experience or an experience that, that you're living through with a group of other people is they're not going to remember what you said to them even though you think that's the most important thing. You think it's the most important thing to share with them all of your amazing knowledge about stress relief or being a goddess or um, looking after your hormones. They're not going to remember that stuff. What they're going to remember is the way you made them feel, the way that they felt as a result of the environment that you created and as a result of the experience you created. So choose the venue that matches the experience that you want to have, not the other way around, not oh, I can only afford X, Y, or Z. Choose it because of the, of the experience you're creating. I've seen the most amazing experiences. You know, we've, we've seen some recent conferences for uh, natural health practitioners. Uh, we saw the Roots and Branch Festival. That looked amazing. That environment was perfect for the herbal kind of community and the growth and the, oh, and the yumminess that was happening there. I've seen some extraordinary events recently with glamping and I've seen some that are, you know, high-end fancy doodah ones. If whatever matches your particular vibe that you're creating for your tribe, go with that and don't skimp on it. All right, so one, pick a date. Two, pick a venue. Three is envision how many people you're going to get there because Again, you, you can't get a quote from a particular place. Uh, and if you're doing a, an Airbnb accommodation or that kind of thing, you need to know how many beds you're going to have and whether or not people are going to be um, twin sharing or they are going to be single. Um, how many availabilities do you have for that particular uh, experience? So when it comes to envisioning how many people, my suggestion is going a little woo-woo on it. When you close your eyes and you think about standing in front of these people and sharing your wisdom and knowledge, how many people do you see? How many people do you really feel you'd be able to hold space for? And this is a really um, interesting experience when you're cre creating and facilitating a group is the group dynamics needs to be held in an energetic space needs to be held in a room and the group dynamics of how people are going to interact 
and whether or not they're going to like or be challenged by the environment that you're creating and how that's going to be interacting will depend on how many people you've got there. So you have to have a, a, a fairly clear number in mind of how many you think you can hold space for and then give or take a certain amount. This way you're able to not only hold a vision for it and therefore your reticular activating system, that, that part of your brain that's looking for patterns around the, around the place and going, oh, there's six people, oh, there's three people, there's this lady and her, her friend, she'll come on board and they'll talk to their, your brain will start to find ways to, to connect you with that amount of people to come into your retreat and your space. So holding a vision for it is really important. And then getting really where we want it is uh, sending yourself messages on your phone or setting your password to however many people you're going to be able to serve on your retreat. So uh, 10, uh, for, 10 for the GC, 10 for the Gold Coast, 10 for the GC. That's your new password. And all of a sudden you're being reminded all of the time about these people that you're essentially sending out vibes to to come on your retreats so uh, envision how many people you're going to have there that's number three number four is envision the journey or the experience you're creating for them this is really important when it comes to uh, again finding a quote because what you what you're actually doing for a place or a space whether it's at a resort whether it's at a, a hiring a space like an Airbnb and then catering uh, whether it is um, borrowing a place from a friend, whether it's creating these camping, glamping kind of experiences, you still need to have an idea of a quote, the numbers, about how many people, what dates it on, how many people, what expenditure it is for the accommodation, what expenditure it is for uh, the catering, and that can vary in a huge way. You can create your own catering, which is great, but it's gonna take you time, money, effort, and even for the shopping list, it's going to cost money. So you need to think about what experience you would like to create for them. So first we're envisioning how many people we've got there. Then it's, an, it's how are we going to experience the journey that we want to take them on. Do we want to take them from really burnt out as a mom or as a, a business owner or as a, uh, somebody who's gone through multiple IVF rounds as somebody who can't, who has been from doctor to doctor to figure out their thyroid condition, whatever it happens to be and who you serve, think about how they come into it and then think about how you'd love them to leave. How would you love them to feel when they come to the end of your, um, your day retreat, your, couple, your long weekend or your week long experience with them? How would you like them to leave? You'd like to, them to feel energized. Think about the words. You'd like them to feel empowered. You'd like them to feel knowledgeable, confident. Think about those words and then think about the journey you want to see them taking from that first day where they feel understood for where they're at, feel heard, uh, feel connected to all the other people in the group, then maybe into the middle of the, the, the journey that you take them on, be it a day, a, a long weekend or a week, how do you want them to feel in the middle? Do you want them to kind of have, you know, if, if you're a, a, a therapist, who a natural therapist or have um, some type of energetic healing where they have a breakdown, where it's, it's really getting into a space of shifting something deep, and then coming out and having a breakthrough at the end? Or do you want them to, to slowly just get more and more excited and more motivated and more whatever it happens to be? What do you want to take them on and what do you want them to experience along the way? And then what little tidbits can you teach them or what little moments can you give them and gift them when it comes to creating space for them to journal, when it comes to uh, bringing in other practitioners to be able to do, uh, I've seen some of our, our, my mentees have brought in drumming circles, they've brought in uh, flower crowns, they've brought in uh, new, other nutritionists or, or Thermomix practitioners to be able to create different foods and, and experience a, um, a food, uh, or medicine experience or massage experience, what are the things that you could bring in that gives them the space to start to heal and, and feel the way you want them to feel at the end of it? 
Hey, Anita and anyone else who's listening on the replay. All right. Uh, so that's number four. Think about the experience because then when you're quoting it and trying to figure out how much these things are going to cost, you have to have had somewhere along the line what these experiences are going to, what these other practitioners are going to bring in, what these other experiences. Every second day of my retreats, we go on a cultural experience. We go and do something that's local, uh, that's possibly giving back, that is understanding the environment or the culture that we're visiting, uh, and uh, something to do with uh, reconnecting with yourself. So we often have uh, yoga, or we'll have massages and other things, and that also has to be factored into the cost. Uh, so making sure that you've got all of those other experiences and the journey you'd like to take them on in your mind and envisaged is really important because with the number one picking the date, number two picking the venue, number three envisioning how many people are going to be there, number four envisioning the journey you're going to take them on, they are all perfectly important for creating a sales page. So before you even think about all the logistics and all the other things, you have to create the sales page. Sometimes, even before you've sold a ticket, you have to create create the sales page or before you've booked an event space because the first sale will actually be the deposit for the event space that you're going to be holding the retreat in. So creating a sales page is hugely important. A sales page is one page on your website or somewhere else. Um, some of us use lead pages or landing pages. MailChimp also has a landing page now that you can fill out and you're creating just a page that the only button on that page is for them to book in or leave a deposit. So on that page, you're going to be putting all of this amazing content that you've been thinking about, the experience they're going to have, the benefits they're going to have from the, how they might feel at the beginning, how they might feel at the end. If it's an intimate retreat, if it's just full of the most you know incredible tribe, if it's a huge event, Whatever it is for, for, that you're creating in your mind, you have to put that on the sales page so that whenever anybody asks, you have somewhere to send them for all the information that they need. And there has to be a button there, either register your interest, but I highly suggest you take a deposit because it's not until somebody gives you the money, the money, put the money where their mouth is, yes, I want to come, and then nothing. Now, I've experienced this and I have so many practitioners that run their retreats and they forget to ask or they feel funny about asking or they, they're not quite sure about how to take their first deposit or how to get the money because it's such a big investment in somebody's health to come on a retreat. But that bit is the most important. I've had so many so disappointed because everybody said, yes, I want to come and nobody actually put the money down. So... More than anything, you need a little deposit button and quickest, easiest thing is to pop a PayPal link up there and make sure that they put their money down so that their position at the retreat is paid for and that money on the back end is actually used to deposit for your event space or your catering or anything else, any of the other things that we were just discussing around the journey. So really, really important, that part of it. Um, don't skip that bit, even if you feel icky about it. It's really important to get the money, <laughs> get the money, because otherwise you literally can't create the, the event. So uh, number five, sales page with a, book, uh, a deposit button. Uh, also put some really good pictures on there. If you're going on a retreat, you want to envisage what you're going to be experiencing on the retreat. Now, even if you've never run a retreat before and you don't have any pictures of you being uh, running a retreat, at least put a picture up of where the event's going to be. So you, you can get an your clients envisaging being in that space, being and feeling the way that they want to feel in that space. Number six, get your first sale. To get your first sale, you want to talk first, mine your network. There should be a plenty of people on your email list. There should be plenty of people that you know that you can think about when you're creating this event that you would love to have on the retreat. And so it's really, really important to invite them it's the first thing you do. Get the first sale is to invite them. And sometimes it is in your friendship circle. Sometimes it is in your old work network circle. Sometimes it's in your LinkedIn. Sometimes it's in your Facebook. But let people know that you're running this event, that you're putting it together. And what do they think? And would they love to come? 
share your vision for it. And that first sale is the thing that actually cements that it's actually going to happen. So more importantly than anything else, invite people to it. And to, imposter syndrome will come in. I promise you, it will come in, it will sneak over your shoulder and go, who are you to run it? Ooh, people might think, ooh, you're thinking, 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 thinking. But the reason that you're creating this in the first place is to create a beautiful, yummy environment that you probably wanted and that you know that's going to be beneficial to somebody. And if you don't invite them to it, it's kind of robbing them of the experience of possibly healing in a way that they would, re would be really receptive to and possibly having an amazing experience with you that they probably can't find anywhere else and they've been waiting for you to do it anyway. So invite them along. Whoever it is that comes to mind that you go, oh, she'd probably really love this. Oh, he and his wife would probably really like. Think about the people and, and actually invite them. It's a beautiful experience to get a letter like that or get an email like that. I've created this event. I really think, given what I know about you and your circumstances, I think it'd be an amazing experience to take your health to the next level and invite them to come along. Worst case scenario, they're going to say no, but at least you've got it out there and, and created an offer for them to make sure that they know that there is a possibility for heal healing and feeling a bit better in a retreat space rather than seeing you one-on-one -on -one all the time. So uh, that is the next one. First up. Number seven, structure enables flexibility. One of the big mistakes I see from a lot of practitioners is I want to create this retreat. I'm really excited about it. And I'll just go with the flow and see what happens. <laughs> I see both ends of the spectrum. I see, oh, I'm going to plan every last minute and then have no spare space for anybody to integrate and have some time out and actually enjoy the retreat. So we have both ends. But you really do need a structure, especially if you're booking with a resort or um, a, a you know, a bigger hotel or accommodation. It's really important that you can create a, a run sheet. Essentially, it's just a little spreadsheet that tells you from the beginning of the day to the end of the day what's happening, where it will be, and a general idea of how much time it takes to actually get through the content that you'd like to share. Now, my first retreats, holy dooly, um, you know, my background's in science. So, I love just vomiting up information on people. And back in the day, oh my goodness, it was like going to school. It was not like going to a retreat at all. I was there, all right, first we're going to share about um, getting to know one another. Then we're going to share about, you know, gut health. And then the next day we're going to do stress. And then we're going to do hormones. And then we're gonna, like hours and hours worth of content. People are coming away on either an urban retreat, the, the basic of basic ones that I was talking about, that one day event, to a full week away with you to actually partly have a holiday and partly heal. And so there has to be a holiday element to what you're creating, a stress relief element that they wouldn't have created for themselves. And don't just fill every last moment. The other thing is when you have a group dynamic, it's very different to having a one-on-one -on -one dynamic. People talk to one another. They want to get to know everybody in the room in a way that you probably won't, haven't kind of gauged the time for. And so it's really important to ha have a, a spacious schedule, but you do have to have a schedule planned out and one that gives them a, a little bit of time to actually integrate the work that you're doing. So uh, structure enables flexibility. Once you have that schedule, you can literally throw it out the window when, when you're in there with the people and noticing what's going on and facilitating the, the, the energy in the room, facilitating the conversation. That's a whole other, other training. But um, the, the most important thing is create some form of a structure. Let the accommodation that you have know about that structure. Let your catering know about that structure. Let whoever it is that needs to know about the timing of those events uh, make sure that they have an awareness about it and you have an awareness about it so that you can understand what you can go with and what you can extend and what you need to shorten. So structure enables flexibility. <laughs> All right, um, number eight, nourish yourself and your attendees. Now, it's really easy to just go over delivering because we're all nurturers, we're all carers in our profession and we love, 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 give, 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 give. But it's a whole other thing for you to be on 
for you know anywhere up to seven days and being on means that you do have to nourish yourself with air with water with food don't skimp on the food <laughs> we're all practitioners and we all have vast majority of us are foodies or we have a food appreciation particularly as food as medicine and one of the biggest uh spaces that you're going to be remembered by is creating a beautiful nourishing menu so don't skimp on the food when you're talking to the catering make sure you cater yourself in not just your attendees and make sure that you are nourishing yourself when you're offering yoga, when you're offering massages, when you're offering when there's another practitioner, make sure you're nourishing yourself. If there's anyone else facilitating with you, take some time out for yourself so that you can rejuvenate and you can actually be on and be present for those people who are there. So don't forget to nourish yourself while you're nourishing everyone else. There's too many times I've seen practitioners get to the end of running their retreat and they go into the biggest, deepest, darkest, oh, poo pit because they haven't quite looked after their adrenals and filling the retreat took so long there was this big build up of the retreat and then they run the retreat and then their adrenals take up so really important to nourish yourself as well as everybody else number nine leverage now this is the bit that a lot of prackies forget as well is you run the retreat you do all these things then the retreat's over and then you have to do the whole thing over again to create another retreat. So if you actually love doing the retreat, some of you will realize by running a retreat that it's not your thing and that's totally cool, but you should definitely give it a go at least once if, if you've got that little spark inside you. But leveraging is really important. And now leverage looks like this. You can have the same, same. And so you can put a certain amount of effort in and... Oh, you get a certain result. If you leverage, you put a certain amount of effort in and you get a much bigger result. Can you see that? So if we're going from here, we're only getting a little result. If we leverage, we're going to get a bigger result. So leverage means how can you take your time, energy, effort and money that it's taken to create the retreat and later on create more from that rather than just running one event and then going and running the next event. So one of the quickest, easiest ways is to get photos or video so that it becomes easier, leverageable, to sell your next retreat, to get people interested and motivated in your next retreat. And so making sure that you get footage, that you get photos, at a minimum get photos, uh, making sure that you get testimonials, so making sure that you're getting feedback on how to change it and shift it for next time, what worked, what didn't work, what could do better. And uh, any, anyone who's going, oh, I had the most amazing experience at this particular event, uh, would you be okay if I use this on my website? So these types of things are really, really important if you're running a retreat and you want to actually leverage it moving forward. Of course, video footage is one of the most extraordinary ones because it gets shared more than anything. And it's able to really get the look and feel and the vibe better than anything else. So if you've got a chance of uh, getting a videographer in for part of it, uh, then you've got a better chance of easily selling into your next event. Cool? All right. Uh, last one, number 10. Show up as best as you possibly can and have fun. This goes back to when I first ran that, that uh, when I ran my second retreat and only three people Three people. I had two people right up until about two weeks before it and then I got a third person. Running a retreat for three people was just as much as a gift for me as it was for them as it was when I ran one for 50 people. The experience and the depth of the conversations, the experience and the attention I could give to those people uh, was profound and an amazing gift and they showed up at the right time for the right reasons in their life to say, yes, I'm ready for a change. So how dare I not show up for that even though there was only three people and I thought I should have like a million. So when you think, when, when the retreat turns out in a different way to the way you expect, it's turned out that way for a reason show up, have fun anyway, 
and then learn the lessons on the back end of it. So that's number 10, and it's really, really important. Show up, no matter what's happening, no matter if someone's complaining, no matter if someone hasn't got there on time, no matter if, no matter if it's just the most amazing experience and all you want to do is cry because it was just the most incredible thing. Either end of the spectrum, show up. Show up with the best that you can in that moment, the best that you can for the vision that you had for it and the vision you continue to hold for, for helping them get from where they're beginning to where they uh, are moving to and show up and have fun. The reason you probably created this event in the first place was to change it up a little because you weren't having as much fun one-on-one, -on -one, you weren't having as much fun filling your books uh, or selling your other programs or courses. You wanted to change it up a bit, so you may as well have fun in it. So retreats are one of my most, uh, oh, I, I just love them. I, I feel so in my element. I feel like I'm flying often, you know, when I'm running retreats. It, the flow just happens. Even if people are canceling in the last minute, even like, and some really interesting challenges happen for people to get themselves on a retreat. Even if all of that happens, I know the right things are happening for the right reasons at the right time for everybody to get what they get out of it. Uh, and it's an extraordinary moment in anyone's lifetime if they put their hand up to say, yeah, I'm this important for this amount of time to take care of myself and I trust you to take care of me in this particular environment for this particular time. And I, oh, I feel so, um, so much gratitude. And so, so it feels like such a gift to be able to do do what I do for people when I'm running retreats, immersions or events. And uh, I would love for you to experience this if you've got that little spark inside you. Now, I'm not saying this is for everybody, but if you do have that little spark inside you and you do want to run a retreat, I hope these 10 have helped you to kind of reframe and reorder the most important things that you need to run a successful retreat. All right. I'm so glad you enjoyed this, Michelle. I hope every, everyone has got something out of this. And if you have got something out of it and you are thinking, hmm, that's on my radar for 2020, go and pick a date. Remember, that's the number one. Go and pick a date. Manifest it. See what happens. And I would love to see all of these amazing events come to life because you're here for a purpose and those people are out there waiting for you to show up in this way for them. And it's already happening. It's just a matter of the timing. All right. It was great to chat to you guys today. If you did get something out of this uh, or, or, you know, bookmark it for the future if you've got it on your plan for 2020, uh, please do share it. If you're watching this on YouTube, press subscribe. And if you're here in the Naturepreneur Hub, make sure that you share it or tag anybody else you know who's been thinking about doing a retreat. And I'll see you next week for another training. See ya.